Welcome uh, back. And uh, so uh, let's start uh, by completing the set of lectures, uh, the, the, the set of slides that uh, we had gone through yesterday. Um, we were discussing uh, coverage. We made the example of the binomial case uh, where Klopper Pearson uh, were the ones that first extracted the the correct coverage that is an over coveraging uh, intervals for the binomial case. Um, I told you about under coverage. Now, there is a thing that happens in high energy physics quite often. And uh, so there, that the CMS collaboration has equipped itself uh, of a statistics committee in order to catch uh, similar things. So things that shows that we reason in an inconsistent manner sometimes. And we write stuff in our papers that we shouldn't. So uh, one, one such thing is what we have come to call uh, flip-flopping after a paper uh, in 1998 by Feldman and Cousins came up and uh, pointed at uh, a way to resolve the issue in a coherent manner. Uh, so let's, let's discuss how the name and construction can be actually producing some problems. And these problems arise because of the support of the variable you are trying to uh, uh, set intervals on, or upper limits uh, or lower limits, is bounded. And this is a very common case in physics where you know that your observable can only be positive, for instance. When you are making inference on the mass of a particle or on the cross-section of an unknown phenomenon, these things are positive. It doesn't make any sense to have an interval from minus 3 to minus 2 of a cross-section. The cross-section is positive defined. So when you have a boundary, uh, the name and construction actually um, uh, as, as trouble, and we'll see how we can fix it, but uh, it still reminds like a hack. So uh, let's take a, a very simplified uh, case. We have an unbiased Gaussian resolution measurement of a variable, a real valued variable. So the Gaussian measurement means that if the variable has a certain value uh, x, mu, let's say, uh, you are likely to obtain values of x, the measured quantity, which are distributed according to a unit Gaussian. Okay, so that's the PDF. So that's the simplest PDF that you can think of. And uh, so this is, a, this is a standard case. And so we will put on the x-axis the observed value as we have done to construct the Neyman interval before, Neyman confidence belt, and the true value of the quantity here. But here, the point here is that the true value of the quantity is bounded to be positive. It's the neutrino mass or something like that, okay? So in this particular setup, if mu is the true value, the experiment is bound to return a value that distributes according to our unit Gaussian. And you have to notice that the Gaussian extends to minus infinity, even if the mu is larger than zero. So you can actually obtain a value of the neutrino mass that is negative because of your data. Or you're measuring a cross-section, and this requires you to subtract the background. And then you end up with a negative number of events. This is common. This happens, OK? So we can be in that situation. So name and intervals for a bounded parameter uh, and a Gaussian measurement uh, produces, for instance, if you take a type 1 error rate uh, of 0 0.05, so you want 95% uh, covering intervals. So, for instance, for uh, getting an upper limit, I told you that you have to derive your confidence belt by integrating from a point to infinity the PDF of x given mu and uh, choosing x1 equals to the, 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 the boundary and x2 equals plus infinity. So that means to get an upper limit, sorry, to get a, an upper limit on a parameter, you have to integrate from a point x1 to plus infinity this curve. 
and you get 0 0.95, and that will determine x1. And so you can draw this, uh, this uh, confidence belt, which is now actually a, a half plane, uh, and for 95% confidence limit, what you will get is that uh, for every x, then you intercept all values of mu up to x plus 1.64, because the integral of a Gaussian from, uh, you, you can do the math, okay, but uh, from uh, uh, the integral uh, from minus 1.64 to plus infinity of a Gaussian is 95%. Uh, if you have alpha equals 0 0.1, uh, then this becomes a little looser, right? But this is the bet that you get, and you will see that you can get an upper limit on mu. This line, there is only one line in the belt, the belt is an half plane in this case, and you get an upper limit and a region of confidence. And this region will start from zero. But what happens if you actually under fluctuate with your data and you actually end up here? where you measure x equals minus 3. It can happen, right? It's a Gaussian PDF. If that happens, Neyman's confidence set is an empty, not, not, not the confidence set itself, but the, the actual interval that you get is empty. So uh, in this region, in this region, the, this, uh, you, get, you, you get in the situation that you cannot quote an interval. And that is very annoying, right? Because uh, it's like you have made no measurement. Or you can only quote mu is equal to zero, which also doesn't make a lot of sense. So we can fix this, the name and construction for the bounded parameter, bounded to be positive, we can fix it by taking the value that you get for x equals zero and say, okay, if I get a negative value, I will still take uh, that upper limit on mu, 1.64. So that's what people usually do in many cases by sticking to Neyman's confidence interval recipe and, uh, and patching it this way. It's a, it's a little bit of a hack, and it actually ends up over covering. But actually, yes, this is, uh, you have to live with this problem. Connected to this is that the other part of the, the issue when you are measuring a cross-section of a physical parameter, let's say that you're, you're, you're searching for, uh, for I don't know, uh, a very rare behedron decay. You know that the particle exists, so no, no big deal. It's predicted by theory. So uh, you, you can search for the particle and you don't see it, then you put an upper limit. But if you are lucky and you actually see the signal at four or five sigma evidence or discovery level significance, uh, you would like to put an interval around that measurement. It's not an upper limit. I actually saw the particle. So I will put a, 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 a boundary. Mu is equal to the cross section is equal to three plus or minus two. I, I, I can measure it. I don't need to put an upper limit in that case. But so. The sentence you read in the papers when you don't see a signal, even CMS has done this sometimes, since we observe no significant signal, we proceed to derive upper limits. This is already betraying that you are thinking bad. You remember the first day we were discussing who thinks bad, who talks bad, thinks bad. Right? And, and, and that is wrong because you cannot flip flop and you cannot decide whether to quote an upper limit or to put an interval around the value that you measure based on the data that you collected. You cannot do that because that is a posterioriness. That is something that ends up undercovering and we'll show how that is possible. So uh, this is basically what, what I said. Typically, we'll uh, search for an exotic phenomenon and, uh, uh, well, uh, this is the other part. This is the part that I just discussed uh, that you will patch the name and confidence interval by, by setting this uh, upper limit uh, at this value, the, the, the 1.64 sigma that you get from this uh, uh, conversion of the, of the p value into the z value. Um, and, and, and yes, and if you find that, that you have a significant signal, then you, uh, you can say that you measure the non-zero non value of that parameter. 
So here is uh, the kind of confidence belt that you end up uh, being using in this particular condition. You have your upper limit uh, that is this diagonal line, which is the one that we were showing before, that it would extend to minus 164 or minus 1.828 sigma and up to infinity here. But you have patched it up by putting uh, a limit uh, at 1.28 sigma. This is a 90% confidence level, so 1.28 sigma here, if you see a negative cross-section, say. And then you have patched it up in another way. If you find a signal that is significant, that is uh, larger than 5, and this is a Gaussian unit, Gaussian measurement, so x larger than 5 means that you are 5 sigma away from 0. Then you say, no, no way, I'm going to put an upper limit. It doesn't make any sense. I will put an interval around my me measurement, and this interval will be this one. And you see that there is also a step here, because you are going from a one-sided interval when you integrate from uh, x1 to infinity uh, to a situation where you have to have half of the type 1 error rate on each side of this interval. So this extends a little bit further than, than this line. Uh, so what you have here is a complex situation where your belt has become quite uh, more uh, featured than the original one of Neyman because you have flip-flopping and you have this arc. But this is, this is what actually pictures the situation that happens in this kind of searches quite often. And we decide to quote an interval rather than quote an upper limit based on the data, because we observe x larger than 5. This is not correct, OK? And the, the, the sentence I was saying betrays this behavior. And we, in the statistics committee, we try to remove that sentence from the papers because it's not, not legal to do that. Sometimes we miss it. So here is a, a proof that we are undercovering. Because the point is that you need coverage for any true value of the cross-section, the neutrino mass, or whatever it is. It is bounded to be larger than zero, but this extends to infinity. So how do you get a coverage plot like this? You take the construction that you have made. Here, for instance, uh, I've just decided to, for a change, to put the discovery, the point where the physicists will decide that they are allowed to quote an interval at 4.5 sigma. And let this be alpha equals 0 0.05, the upper limit, and 95% confidence limit, confidence level. So let's see how this happens. Imagine that mu is very small. Then what you are doing is your PDF gets integrated from a very small value, 0 0.4, down to up to 4.5, this is basically taking the integral from minus infinity to 4.5 of a unit Gaussian, and this is basically 1. So the coverage for that particular value of mu of this confidence belt is 1. But then if you imagine that mu is a little bit larger, you start to be integrating a, a Gaussian which has a mean of, say, 1.5, and so the mean is here, and you integrate from minus infinity to 4.5, and this becomes a little bit less than 1, and you see it here. But then when you are inside of this region, you undercover. Why? Because, say, 2.5, 2.3 is the mean of mu, and so you are integrating something which has a mean of 2.3, but you integrate only from here, so you cut away all this probability density, and you integrate that to 4.5. So at this point, you are undercovering. Your coverage is only in 0.935 or something like that. And if you go ahead here, you also get to a plateau where all this integral of the PDF is moving forward, but it's 93%, it's, it's 92.5% or something. And then when you get back to a, a situation where you have uh, these vertical intervals cover 95% uh, again, so basically, what we are looking at is a situation that, depending on the unknown value of the quantity you are estimating, you may have under coverage. 
that collectively is under coverage for your measurement because your measurement is just a random explicitation of that situation. You don't know beforehand what value of mu you are going to measure. And moreover, you don't know exactly what the true value of mu is. So your intervals don't fulfill the coverage properties that you were uh, selling to your cost, uh, customers, the final users of your article. So this is a problem, and uh, it has been, uh, um, has been dealt with in various ways. We will see in the other set of slides, actually, uh, uh, various comparisons of the upper limits, the confidence belts that you can draw for this particular unit Gaussian, very special case. I have a routine that I put in the area that the, I, I linked it already that can draw this for any kind of values uh, of, uh, of the type 1 error rate and uh, the discovery level significance. But OK, once you, once you understand how you get this uh, coverage plot from the confidence belt, this is uh, kind of trivial. It's just a call, a, call, a repeated call to the Earth inverse function. So the conclusion is not for today, but for these first uh, few minutes, uh, well, leveraging what we said yesterday also, um, we saw our handling nuisances and putting uh, nuisances inside the systematic uncertainties inside the calculation of a tail integral in a frequentist way can uh, force you to ask questions to yourself. What do I want to do with the negative part of the PDF if it extends there? Do I, what do I do with that part of the probability density? We saw this when we, we, we ran the Poisson probe fix and fluct. Uh, routines. Uh, modeling uh, is an unsolvable problem. In fact, uh, statisticians like to say that all models are wrong, but some of it are useful. Yes, we, we, we do modeling. Uh, Tillman yesterday was saying that we don't do modeling at the LHC in particle physics. He's right and, and he's also simplifying things. He's not wrong, but he's simplifying things because we do use models of our final distributions in order to extract information. But what he was implying was that the, 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 the whole machinery of forward simulation is a likelihood free inference setup. Um, so you need to consider a wide spectrum of functional forms if you want to do a good job at trying to extract the inference that is not biased by your personal uh, belief or choice of a model for the data that you have. Uh, under coverage is bad. It's equivalent to reporting a smaller uncertainty than what you uh, should be allowed to do. And you, shouldn't, you should try to avoid it, OK? Bayesian methods don't, 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 don't fulfill that requirement. They may have undercover. That is why many of us don't like them. And the root has tons of built-in functions and tools uh, that, uh, that uh, we, we have used some of them, only some of them, but uh, okay. Nowadays, people are moving to Python, and that's fine. Things move on, but uh, there's transition periods where things uh, are still easier or more complete on one side of the, of the fence. All right, so that's uh, all I had. If you have questions on uh, deriving intervals, you may want to shoot them now, although we are still going to discuss some of them in the other sets of slides. So what questions do you have? No questions. Very good. That means I've been very clear. Okay, so this is the uh, last uh, file uh, of my lectures. I have not uploaded it yet. I will put it on Slack, actually, because it's easier if I understand correctly. And uh, what we are going to cover today is more or less this. We will finally discuss ancillarity, which I think is one of the highlights of these lectures, because it's something that you don't find in textbooks. Not many textbooks have it. But it's still very important. Uh, we will talk of frequentist and Bayesian techniques a little bit, just to fill a, a little bit in the blanks. Uh, you certainly know Bayes theorem, but okay, let's go through this stuff. 
we will discuss one interesting paradox you might not have seen and might not be, is not in fact in any textbook that I know of. We will talk a little bit about the likelihood principle, which is the fact that all the information about a measurement is enshrined in the likelihood function. But sometimes some, some of the ways to draw inference will not only use that. And so we have to see what, what ways of extracting information fulfill the likelihood principle. Then we'll do a, a little bit of hypothesis testing. Uh, we will talk at this uh, alpha level, beta of the power, etc. And maybe tomorrow we will go on the goodness of fit, how you combine p-values, and we will talk about uh, the machinery that uh, derives uh, uh, results, uh, for instance, the X combined tool that has been used at the LHC to derive conclusions on the existence of the X boson. But I find this part, I must say, I put it at the end because some of the times I don't even get here because <laughs> we have a lot of material to cover. But that's, that's the, the reason why I, I, I don't like to talk about it is that I cannot add a lot of wisdom on it because if you go to, to the web pages of X combine, you find more information than I can possibly give you and uh, explained even, even better than I can. So, but maybe we will get there. Anyways, let's continue a little bit to, to discuss this bounded mu problem because uh, uh, this is uh, this actually belongs to the to the previous part of the discussion. But we are still in this Gaussian measurement uh, setup uh, where uh, mu is bounded to be positive, but you measure x to be also negative sometimes, and you see here uh, the confidence belts. These are upper limits, in fact that you can obtain by using different methods. And you will recognize that one is uh, the Neyman construction, a diagonal line that extends to um, impossible values of mu. So the, if you measure minus four, the upper limit and 90% confidence level by Neyman construction will tell you that mu is uh, smaller than minus, uh, uh, minus uh, 2.72 because it's 1.28 sigma above minus 4. And this is completely stupid, right? Because we know that mu is actually larger than 0 by construction. So you can fix the, uh, the well, first of all, when you, when you, when you go uh, and, and say, well, but I want to include the constraint, you get this dashed line here. But this actually gets empty, empty sets. So you can fix it by putting a line at 1.28 sigmas, as we are saying. And, uh, and then we have a Bayesian solution with a step function prior. What does it mean, a step function prior? That you take the likelihood of your data, but you multiply it by a prior which says mu has to be positive. And if mu is positive, what you do with a prior, you say, I have uh, private information that tells me that uh, Mu as a PDF that I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, in fact, how large this is because I need to integrate this to be one if I want it to be a PDF. So I don't know how high it is because it depends how far I extend it to and then I have to stop. So this a flat prior is uh, something undefined because it implies that you are also putting an upper limit here. And you're saying, OK, but I don't care about mu being larger than 10. So this is 0 0.1 for this to be uh, a proper PDF, right? So you are actually a hacking a little bit. So you are putting some subjective information in. But OK, this is a flat prior. A flat prior should be not influencing your inference. It's false because it depends on that upper limit. But anyways, this flat prior is multiplied by your likelihood produces that nice smooth curve, which is very nice because it doesn't, doesn't change abruptly here. And uh, it gives you always a, a, an upper limit which is larger than zero, even if your x is very much smaller than zero. Um, and then there is even a MacFarlane's loss of confidence, this, this curve that extends up. How can it extend up if x is larger and smaller and smaller than zero? Because Imagine that you measure x equal minus 10 in a Gaussian resolution of sigma equals 1. You know that you have made a mistake, 
you cannot any longer believe that uh, your uncertainty on the on the measurement is one because you certainly know that you have made a mistake somewhere. So you lose confidence on the, your ability of draw, dri, deriving inference, and you put your upper limit uh, as actually a linear negative slope uh, function of the negative x. So you, you s the gist of this plot is that there's a lot of technology going into trying to derive intervals that actually work, that uh, are sensible, that uh, always give you a positive answer that don't extend in the negative forbidden region. So this is an active research topic. And in fact, in 1998, uh, Gary Feldman and, uh, and Bob Cousins uh, uh, produced uh, yet another curve, which is not in this graph because it's, this is an old graph, by uh, deriving upper limits uh, using uh, the inversion of the probability uh, test like, uh, like Neyman's construction, by using a, a particular ordering principle, which is uh, basically based on the likelihood ratio of the hypothesis. And, and they derived a, a, a unified view because you could uh, seamlessly change from uh, uh, quoting an upper limit to quoting an interval on the parameter in a way that didn't flip flop, in a way that didn't undercover. So this was the solution, and this is the solution, the frequentist solution to the bounded uh, mu problem that doesn't do flip-flopping and gives you correct coverage. So this has now 2,000 and more citations and everybody's using it in uh, neutrino physics and many other fields. In particle physics, we do use it, but not always. It's a little bit computationally heavy to derive. Um, and okay, I, I didn't have a, I don't have the time to describe it in more detail than this, but that's, uh, that's what it is. There's one more thing to note about, uh, about, uh, uh, about this belt, and that is called uh, what are relevant subsets. So we, this is Neyman's construction with, uh, for, for the Gaussian measurement with a bounded parameter when you don't fix uh, this uh, with the straight line in that negative x. And this, this is Neyman's coverage uh, construction for the upper limit, and it's guaranteed to cover. And yet, it has this disturbing property that uh, you can devise a betting strategy against uh, these intervals that are derived from this uh, construction. For instance, if you have a 5% uh, type 1 error rate, which is what used, is used to construct this graph, you can bet at 1 over 20 odds, so that is, I bet $1, and if your, cover, your interval doesn't cover, you will pay me $20. This is a fair bet, right? Because the intervals you're quoting at are at 95% confidence level, and therefore, there's a 5% chance, a 1 in 20 chance that the interval doesn't cover, if the coverage is correct. So I bet $1, you give me $20 if uh, actually mu is not in the interval you're quoting. And we do this many, many times. We should break even, right? No, because I can devise a betting strategy that says, just choose a real constant. I choose x equals uh, one, say. If you report x equals, uh, uh, um, if your measurement is x uh, larger than one, I will not bet against your interval because I think it's okay. But if x is less than one, I will bet against your interval. On average, I will win money because of the, this particularity. So this is, uh, this is actually <laughs> very, very wrong. In fact, if you put the K, if you only bet when K is less than minus 1.64, this wins every bet. So this is clearly a, 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 mis, a, a, a problem. And uh, the, the way to say that this is a problem in statistic is to say that there are relevant subsets. That the inference you draw depends on the subset of the observable space, which is the real axis for x, uh, that you are actually um, um, that you are actually considering. So this k uh, splits uh, the observable space in relevant in, in two spaces, and the subspace of uh, small k is a subspace where your coverage is actually small. So this is a problem. The procedure is not making the best inference on the data. And that allows me to introduce the concept of uh, uh, conditioning. So 
this, this flow that we just described can be amended by adding this horizontal line. But in general, the problem can be discussed uh, by talking about ancillary statistics. What is an ancillary statistic? An ancillary statistic is a function of the data. Function of the data, you cannot compute it. It's a statistic, so it's a function of the data, right? That yields information about the precision of the estimate that you can draw with the data, but has no information about the value. So in the opera neutrino case, uh, I made an example. The ancillary statistic was the number of neutrinos that you had gotten. The number of neutrinos bears on the precision that you will have on the timing measurement, but knows nothing about the timing. Okay, that is an ancillary statistic in this case. And what I was saying back then was that you should condition to the particular conditions of the opera experiment if you want to better study the property of the intervals that they are getting. We were concerned with the uncertainty of the timing measurement in opera, and we were discussing, you know, the midpoint versus the mean, the mean as a U and VU. Uh, and uh, I was telling you, by conditioning to n equals 20, I will always run my pseudo experiments with 20 neutrinos observed because that will give me better inference. It will give me inference that is relevant to the subset of the observable space which Opera actually illuminated with its measurement. So I'm not looking at the whole space of the possible number of neutrinos that it's 20 plus or minus Poisson of 20 that Opera could have gotten in many other universes. In this universe, Opera measure 20, so I will condition to that subspace by using the ancillary statistic, which is the number of events collected, and therefore I will be looking at the subspace, the relevant subspace. So this is conditioning, okay? Um, but there is a, 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 there is a way to look at it that uh, explains more about what I'm just making the point with the number of neutrinos, it's actually a nice example. So in particle physics, we have uh, often the case that we are measuring the branching fraction for a particle decay. And so we, what we do is we count, for instance, the number of decays in two different final states, and we observe an A and an B counts in the two final states, and the probability that I should observe, so say, imagine that you only have these two possibilities, that this particle can decay in, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, pi zero goes to uh, gamma gamma, or sometimes pi zero goes to gamma I plus in lines. I don't know, something like that. So you, you want to measure a particular branching fraction, and you do the probability that you observe uh, counts in the two channels, as the Poisson probability of observing a certain number in one channel, given a certain uh, probability for it to happen, and the probability is, uh, well, the cross-section times the branching ratio, rho, times the probability that you observe uh, a certain number of events and b in the other channel. This is uh, describing the probability of your observation in, in full, right? And mathematically, you can prove uh, that this uh, product of Poissons is uh, exactly equal to the Poisson of observing the total number of events that you collectively have seen in the two channels, PA, NA plus NB, which now depends only on the total mean, the total cross-section, not any longer by the branching fraction, times a binomial factor that tells you how often you see one particular decay, a fraction of successes, if you want, an A, when the total number of observation, that number of trials, is an A plus an B. Given, this time, a parameter rho, the branching fraction, a no longer depending on the total cross-section. What are you trying to measure here is the branching fraction. You're not trying to measure the cross-section, you don't care. So in fact, what you should do is to condition to saying, okay, I observed an A plus and B events. I don't care how many events I observed because that total number 
doesn't depend on the, the branching fraction. It only depends on the cross-section. So I factor it out. I leave it alone in my inference. I totally disregard it. But I know that by doing so, I am focusing on a relevant subset of my observable space, which is the two-dimensional plane of all possible NA and NB realization. And I focus on the subspace which has exactly an A plus an B equals to some particular value. And if an A plus an B is a certain value, that is a, that is a line like this, right? So this line will give me a certain uncertainty on my row parameter. And if I add a line here, it would give me a smaller cross uh, uncertainty on the row parameter, of course, because I have a larger number of events. But I constrain myself to thinking about that particular subset of the data. So by using this second expression, we may ignore the ancillary statistic Na plus Nb here and only use it as the denominator in the, our extraction of the row factor because that is all that contains information about the parameter rho. Is that clear? I think it is, right? Yes? I have assumed that, sorry, what? An A and an B are two Poisson phenomena, yes. Considered independent. That is exactly correct. I consider them independent, and they are independent. Uh, in most conceivable setups of a, of a practical uh, cross-section measurement. So you are basically looking at uh, two different channels. Uh, and uh, you, I, I know what you're thinking, but OK, but uh, I, I am producing a certain particle. Sometimes it decays into one, K, into one final state, and sometimes it decays in the other final state. Why don't they talk to each other? But they are still, you should think at this quantum process as a, as a whole. You are producing a certain final state from a certain collision, which goes through the production of a particle. But they are effectively two independent Poisson processes. So by restricting the sample space, the problem is simplified, and your inference improves. Why does it improve? Because you're saying, yes, I have a certain uncertainty on the, on the row factor, but it's, uh, it's, it's worse than this, for instance. Why am I improving? It's not that you are improving the uncertainty. It's that you are deriving intervals that are more appropriate for your ex ex explicitation of the experiment. And so, for instance, when we were doing the example with Opera, we were saying uh, the sigma that applies to 20 neutrinos, uh, if you use the midpoint, is 1.7 nanoseconds. And that is a precise observation that doesn't apply if I had drawn uh, pseudo experiments with 15, 25 events. And then I would have a much, uh, a, 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 actually, a different estimate for the mean of the uh, variance that I should observe. I, I should actually, I would actually have biased my result. And so I can make another example for you. So this is, uh, this is uh, two scales, two, two arm scales, like the one we were discussing two days ago. But one of them is more precise. Uh, one gives you a 10% uncertainty, and another gives you a 1% uncertainty. Uh, so imagine that uh, the procedure includes the flipping of a coin. You toss a coin, and if it comes up heads, uh, you are allowed to use the most precise scale. And if it comes out tails, you have to use the less precise scale. So this is your setup. Now you do the experiment, that is, you toss the coin. That's a gene, toss the coin, yes. And uh, it comes out, whatever it comes out, and you proceed and do the measurement. What uncertainty do you quote? Do you quote 10% because you got the tails and you had to do the measurement with the uh, lousy scale? Or do you quote a combination of the two because the whole space encompasses all possible realization of the tossing of the coin? Of course, you want to quote 10% because you 
got to measure the, the weight with the lousy scale. You know it. But Neyman's constructions would force you to use the full space to derive your, your uncertainties, OK? In this case, OK, I was saying they, they would get the more precise scale, but OK. So Neyman construction is unconditional on the outcomes. It doesn't know about that. the outcomes. I told you, you build the confidence belt before you draw the experiment, before you flip the coin. But it would require you to include the coin flipping in the procedure and therefore to have an uncertainty which is not the one that you actually know that you have. So this is, this is, this is food for thought. You should think about it any time that you can actually condition on some subset of the observable space because you know that the condition of your measurement made it such, you should definitely consider it and uh, find the ancillary statistic that is a function of your data that does not have any information on the parameter you want to measure. It has information about the variance, but it doesn't have information on the mean and factor that out. It's, it's another example here, locating the box, pretty much the opera measurement, right? Find the center of the box uh, of, uh, from two measurement uh, random IID variables sampled from this probability density function, which uh, extends minus a half on each side of so mu. Suppose that you get uh, that the true value is one, so in turn, this could produce two measurements that are 0.91 and 1.01, and the other is 0.6 and 1.4. What would you choose to be, what situation would you prefer to be in? Would you like to be get given the sample A or the sample B? Who likes the sample A? 0.91 to 1.01. Who likes sample B? A few more hands. Okay, you are shy this morning. So, of course, if you think about it, x, the, the farther away these two values are, the, the less the box can move around because it's constrained by this guy if it wants to move this way and it's constrained by this guy if it wants to move the other way. So, the farther away these two points get, the more precise is your inference on the center of the box. Now, Neyman procedures maximizing power in the unconditional space, so before you have actually gotten two measurements, but only know that you're going to get two measurements, will yield the same confidence interval for these two data sets. That is, since uh, mu is equal to one, I mean, you will get uh, the, 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 an uncertainty that is the same because they are both centered around uh, one with a different uh, width, but they are centered around one, so the box will be, uh, the estimator for the box center will be one in both cases, and then Neyman will tell you, okay, the uncertainty on that uh, box location uh, uh, point estimate is such. But you ended up getting the better data set, and you know that your inference is more precise than the sample sample. You can restrict to the subset. But what is it, what is it that allows you to restrict to that subset? What is it that partitions the whole space into relevant subsets that have different precision on the box center? It is the absolute value of x1 minus x2. That is the ancillary statistic in this case. It is the statistic that partitions the space into subsets which have exact same coverage properties and different from one to the other. Right? You can convince yourself about, about this. The larger x1 minus x2 gets, and the, the more precise can be your inference on mu in this particular case. Questions? Good. So the takeaway bit is that uh, uh, the quality of your inference depends on the breadth of the world space that you are considering. The more you can restrict it, the better. Okay? because the more relevant to the data you actually got, your inference can be, and that's the uncertainty that you have. So the point here is that, uh, okay, it may be easy to find the ancillary statistic in the locating the box problem, but it is not easy to find an ancillary statistic in a typical high energy physics experiment. Okay, we saw it 
in the binomial ratio, the, the branching fraction measurement is not difficult. But in other cases, it's more convoluted. But there are ancillary statistics, and you should find them because they will improve your intervals. OK? So look for them. If you can find one and your colleague across the ring doesn't, you will outperform their results. Now, let me talk to you briefly about frequentist and Bayesian schools and how they, they part and how they make uh, different uh, statements and what are the strong points of the one and the other. This is really uh, something that uh, the statistics departments are divided into the frequentists and the Bayesians. They talk to one another at coffee time, but, <laughs> but they have very different uh, philosophical views on how you should draw inference. So um, let's talk about probability. Probability definition is based on three axioms that were enunciated by uh, Kolmogorov in 1933. He was the first to do this. Uh, you consider all possible elementary events xi mutually exclusive. So you have a space of observations and you can partition it in all of the elements of this space. You can define the probability of occurrence of one of them by saying that the probability is larger than zero for all of them. And the probability of one or the other, that you should get one or this uh, or, or, or the other of two possible observations, is the sum of the two elementary probabilities. So this, the probabilities of independent and uh, mutually exclusive events add. And the sum of all these probabilities is equal to 1. Okay. So if you do that, you will have a whole space. And then you can consider non-exclusive sets that include the possibility that x belongs to one set and another. So you may define subsets of these elementary events. And you can say that the probability to obtain an event in A or B, which is this total uh, two ellipses area, is the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of the intersection of them. OK? This is very trivial. And then you can uh, go on and define the conditional probability that you get uh, A given B. So you, you are in B. What is the probability of A given B? Well, it is this area divided by the total area of B. OK? So this is uh, geometrically constructed. It's easy to derive. And uh, well, you also, you also may have situations where A and B are independent if they are disjunct in the space. So if uh, in that case, uh, the probability of A given B is equal to the probability, uh, uh, sorry, independent. Yeah. So OK, well, uh, in that case, the probability of, uh, of uh, uh, the Mutual probability, the, the probability that you are in this area, is the probability of A times the probability of B. If you have this, you can uh, actually obtain uh, the probability of A given B multiplied by the probability of B. And this will be equal to the probability of B given A multiplied by the probability of A. I'm going fast because I think this is an any textbook and doesn't don't, we don't want to waste our time on this. But there is actually a geometrical construction that allows you to visualize the conditional probability, p of a given p of a times p of b given a. And, uh, and this is uh, p of a is this, uh, the probability of a divided by this whole space. And p of b given a is this small bit divided by the whole probability of a. And, and then you can easily do the multiplication of these areas. And you convince yourself uh, of what these formulas are. And then you derive a Bayes theorem, which is uh, given by this formula, which basically tells you how to invert the probability. Right? You go from the probability of B given A to the probability of A given B by uh, well, normalizing by the full uh, observations and multiplying by the prior of A. So this is Bayes theorem, and it's uh, used uh, in a lot of situations where you invert the, the, 
the, the, the, the, the probability. So you observe a certain x and you want to make a statement about mu. So you invert the probability by you looking at the likelihood function for obtaining x given a certain mu, multiplying by your prior probability of mu, of a certain mu, that you need to plug into the problem. And then you will get the probability of mu given the data that you had. So this is an operative uh, definition of how you can actually draw inference from your data, but it rests on your specification of the probability of the variable that you want to estimate before you draw the data. That is called the prior probability. And the prior probability, we were talking about the flat prior here, is something that, uh, well, it's debatable because, uh, okay, there may be prior experiments that have derived an interval for this quantity. So I might imagine that mu has been measured by many experiments and it could be actually very well defined what, 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 what the values of mu can be because they are constrained by previous experiments. And then I can plug that very precise prior in my inference and then I can improve it by my additional measurement so it will become something like this, not something like this, or something like, and, and Bayes theorem allows you to play with these densities and uh, improve your inference as you go. And this is very useful, but uh, it also has the property that it allows you to talk about the probability of a parameter of a nature having a certain distribution, which frequentists don't want to do for the life of them, okay? And so the two schools part. Uh, you need to define, well, the whole space and, uh, well, okay, we said these things. Instead, frequentists uh, will take another approach. They talk about probability as an empirical limit of the frequency ratio between the number of successes and trials. So you have to have a repeatable experiment and then the probability is the limit as the observation space goes to infinity of the successes over trials. Uh, it's good to define this as a limit, it's not a problem, um, but this can only be applied to repeatable experiments. It's hard to define in a frequentist way the probability that you die if you fall off the third floor window, right? You cannot repeat the experiment. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and begrudgingly. <laughs> Uh, all right, so uh, in a Bayesian framework, uh, uh, to solve the problem of unrepeatable experiments, you have to put in your degree of belief. What is my prior probability that I die if I fall off the third window? 50%, 30%. So the best way that was cooked up by Definetti in the early 20th century was to say, okay, well, let's define my, my belief in terms of a coherent bet. What is the highest odds that I am willing to bet on concerning this particular uh, uh, experiment? So uh, the maximum expense that you're willing to pay off, um, sorry, the maximum expense that you're willing to pay in order to be promised a certain return of a certain amount of money. So that is to say, I have a 10% belief that it will rain today. And that is because the maximum I'm willing to bet for a return of $10 is $1. I don't want to bet $2 that it's going to rain if I only get a payoff of $10 because I don't think that the probability of rain is 15 or 20% or 25%. I only think that the probability of rain is 10%. So I'm willing to bet up to $1 if you promise me 10 if it rains. This is a coherent bet. And this is a way that we can allows us to talk to one another and say, what do you think is the probability that it rains tomorrow? Well, how much money are you willing to put on the table, right? Uh, so this, of course, depends on the observer. And it also depends on the system you are trying to probe. So it does depend on the observer. Some of us have a stronger belief that it will rain today than others. I think I'm gonna take my umbrella when I go downtown today. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> because I'm such, uh, but okay. 
uh, there's a huge literature on this topic. And in science, we would like our results to be coherent. What does it mean them, for them to be coherent? If we determine a probability of a parameter that has a certain range, we would like to be impossible for someone to bet against our interval and win money in the long run, as we were showing in the, in the, in the discussion we did before with the Neyman construction. So this is actually pretty much the heart of the matter of why we go frequentist rather than Bayesians. So example of coherent bets, uh, okay, you bet one dollar that you get a six upon throwing a die. That is a coherent bet because you know that you have six possible equal outcomes. And uh, so the coherent return is six dollars. This is a fair bet. And the example, the other example, you can bet about uh, your favorite soccer player to score in tomorrow's game for a return of $100. And uh, some of us believe in this player more and some will believe less. So some will bet more, dollar, more money and some will bet less money. So it's a, social, a subjective prior, but it is uh, well defined by the fact, uh, by the amount of money you put on the table. Now let's see how we can use Bayes theorem as frequentists, because we do. Using Bayes theorem doesn't make you a Bayesian. Always using Bayes theorem makes you a Bayesian, okay? But we can use Bayes theorem. So let's try to determine the probability of uh, a jet being actually coming from the adronization of a big work when you have an algorithm that says that it is a B jet, so that it is B tagged. So the setup is that you have jets and uh, you have an algorithm that uh, says this is uh, likely to be a B jet and this is not a B jet. You know what B quarks are, right? You know how you have B jets in hadron collisions and uh, they are valuable probes of rare phenomena. So you want to do this. So the probability that uh, you uh, have a bit tag uh, if it is a, a jet coming from a big quark, let this be 50%. You have a pretty good bit tagging method that will uh, uh, tell you a true positive, so to speak. It is, uh, it is uh, a big jet when you tag it 50% of the time. This is called the efficiency to identify big quark jets. The denominator is big jets. And the efficiency is the success cases, right? The fraction of successes. And also, you are given the probability that you do tag uh, the jet, but it was not a big jet. So this is the fake rate, 2%. OK? Uh, from these two probabilities, you can also get the, the complementary, right? The complementary to these two cases. It is a big jet, but you don't be tagged. It is not a bidget, but you do tag. Uh, you don't be tagged. So this is 98%. Uh, so you have a right, uh, good rejection. So this is uh, captured in this graph where the whole space is this rectangle, and you know you have a fraction of bidgets, and of this fraction of bidgets, uh, half of them are real B, half of them aren't B. Sorry, you don't be, be tagged some of them, but although they are bidgets, and you do be tagged some of them, 50%. But then when they are not coming from a B adronizations, you only tag a small fraction of them, 2%. So the question for you is, given a selection of B tagged jets, what fraction of them are, B, are, are, are actually coming from B adronization? So what is the probability conditional uh, uh, of it, a jet being B tagged that it is actually a B? So what is it? Nobody wants to try? I bet nobody wants to try because you cannot. You cannot answer this. You need, in addition to this, to know where this line is, to know how much of the fraction of jets are B jets in the first place. You need the prior. You need the probability that they are B jets in the whole space, so where this line is. Then you know what this fraction is and you can compute everything. 
In that case, you can plug this into the Bayes theorem, and you can say that the probability of being a B jet when it is B tagged is proportional. Well, there is a normalization factor in, in Bayes theorem to the probability of it being a B tag given that it is coming from a B times your prior. Then you can invert the conditionality and you get this number. So you get in the end that this, this, this number I was asking is 56.8%. Okay, this is a frequentist example of applying Bayes' theorem. Uh, instead, Bayesians uh, will use Bayes' theorem with a different flavor. They will put in their subjective probability. For a frequentist, uh, for instance, uh, then that wants to measure the neutrino mass or anything like that, the probability of the parameter of nature having a particular value uh, makes no sense. They don't want to talk about it. Uh, so in that case, you cannot put a prior and you cannot get a posterior. Instead, Bayesians will use uh, happily their Bayes theorem and they will say, well, I have a degree of belief of my quantity being here and I will plug it in, I will add the likelihood function, which is this, which is not a PDF, okay? Uh, the probability of, of the parameter given that you observe some data, that, that is actually written P of X zero given theta, the probability of obtaining some data when you, the parameter has a certain value is actually the likelihood function. And it's not a PDF. On this equation, you have a PDF on the left side, a PDF on the right side. This is not the likelihood, it's not a PDF. This is an integral, it's just a number, okay? Very good. So they will put in this degree of belief and this will allow to invert the conditionality. So this we said, let's make a Bayesian example. You have a background-free experiment, so you expect zero event in a counting experiment, and a theorist uh, as a model for uh, an exotic new particle signal, and uh, expects that you should see three events in those 150 inverse femtobans of data that you collected just now. So what we do is that we can get the probability of seeing zero events uh, so, is, if the model is true, the probability of getting zero events is actually the probability that uh, zero plus three fluctuated down to zero. So it is this uh, Poisson number, and it's actually 5%. And the probability that you get zero event if the model is false, that this is, the signal is actually zero, the probability is one, because the background gives you zero, the signal gives you zero, the probability that the number can only be zero. And the probability that you get greater than zero events if the model is true or false are these uh, complementary numbers. Now imagine that the experiment is in fact performed and now you get in fact zero events, dommage, okay? What is the probability that the model is true? What is the probability that there is a signal if you see zero events? So how do you invert this to get the probability of the model given that you have observed zero events? You can use Bayes, fact, Bayes, Bayes theorem, right? But again, you cannot determine this from the information that I gave you. You need to state your degree of belief. You need to plug in the prior for the model, right? The probability that the model of the theorist is true. So what is the probability that, uh, that uh, John Ellis was right and there is a supersymmetry or something? Is it 5%, 1%? Anybody can say, right? And it's, it's very moot. So only then can you invert the conditionality. And if the model that you are testing is the standard model, then you have a very high degree of belief after you have done the experiment. So uh, in any case, uh, so it depends what, what model you are testing, in a sense, what degree of belief you are willing to give to that prior. So it's kind of difficult to use this theorem in practical applications of particle physics. What, 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 what frequentists uh, cannot do with their inference is what Bayesians do, and that is why, why Bayesians uh, actually We need of taking decisions based on the actual results of the, their inference. 
so decision make in forces you actually to use Bayes' theorem. Imagine that you want to determine the probability that uh, uh, some new physics model is true given some data. And you determine it with Bayes' theorem to be very high. And you want to decide uh, whether you want to go public and publish a paper that will either bring you to Stockholm on some day or uh, then bring you ridicule because uh, later on people will say that you were wrong. What should you decide? What do you do? Well, the problem is that uh, you need a cost function. You cannot decide what to do if you don't plug in a cost function which will multiply the various possibilities times the odds that you have determined. So your decision on what to do uh, requires two subjective inputs, not one, your prior probabilities, which you are already not happy to give, and the relative costs of the various outcomes to you. So it's really subjective, but it's, uh, it's something that is actually good if you are investing money, because your subjective inputs might be better than the other guys. So in any case, classical hypothesis testing doesn't provide that. So it is not a complete decision-making theory. Maybe perhaps because of that, uh, we sometimes get stuck and we say, what do we do with this paper? What do we do with this result? Should we go public or not? And we start discussing and we don't take decisions for a long time. Uh, I think I said many of these things. Uh, uh, I, the point uh, that I need to make frequently is the likelihood is not a probability density. We saw that the Bayes' theorem that you only have a density on each side of the equation. The term likelihood was invented for this uh, exactly to distinguish from a function of observables. It's something that can only write uh, with fixed observables. Um, one uh, interesting point is uh, reparameterization invariance. So if you have a PDF of some data given a parameter and you change uh, from a variable to a function of that variable, you can write uh, uh, the probability of the latter by using the Jacobian, okay? And this will guarantee that if you have, uh, that the probability is uh, mapping to one another. The probability that the function of X1 is uh, in a certain range is uh, equal to the probability of the, the value being in the certain range. So the probabilities are invariant under changes of variable, but not their density functions that change actually very much. Um, yeah, so the likelihood is invariant under a parameterization. And in fact, it's not a PDF in the, in the, fun in the, in the parameter because the density functions do not possess this property. Um, so, Bayesian reasoning with subjective probability prior is uh, a coherent way, way in, in, uh, of uh, updating your personal beliefs uh, by observing new data. What I mean by that is that in our real life, we are Bayesians. We react to the environment, we make experiences, we put our hand over the oven when we are three years old and we get burned and then we don't do it again. We update our beliefs on what hurts us and, and we do this unconsciously all of the time. So we are actually Bayesians. Because we have our subjective experience and we use it to model our world and to react to it, okay? So that is good. Uh, the question remains if we in science can do this and if we can do it in an objective way because we would like our results to be objective. If we die uh, 100 years from now, people will still be able to use our results even if we had very peculiar ideas on what exists in the world, what are the laws of nature. So there was a guy called Harold Jeffries in the uh, mid 20th century who uh, said, can we define a prior which contains the least possible amount of information on the parameter such that uh, we will let the data speak the most? So you multiply the prior by the likelihood. It is the likelihood that drives what the posterior will be. It is not our choice of prior. So if I change the prior, or uh, let's say a continuous variation of the prior will con 
produce a minimal variation of the posterior given the data. So he was looking for these uh, this, uh, this priors that were minimally informative. Uh, here, as a, I, I'm putting this comment here, that if you choose a uniform distribution uh, of, as a prior, let's say I don't, I, I don't know what to put for the cross-section prior in this measurement, so let's put a flat prior in the cross-section, but I want it to be positive. Or it could be even be the prior on a mass, and the mass could be, or not a mass, but a parameter that is a real continuum, no boundary, uh, a real distribution, if you put a flat prior around it, you are, not, uh, uh, you are not putting no information on it because under a reparameterization of the, of the parameter to another parameter, the probability density, in fact, gets a totally different shape. It, does, it gets reparameterized, it changes, and therefore you are putting information, but you don't know it. Just because you are thinking in terms of uh, a neutrino mass instead of squared neutrino mass, which is actually what experiments did get uh, when they were doing this, uh, you think you're not giving information, but you are. So flat priors, in fact, for statisticians, what they call flat priors are Jeffrey priors, which are not flat in the metric. <laughs> That's a kind of a strange thing. Uh, so. Jeffrey's work resulted in what are called reference priors, but statisticians will also call them flat priors. Uh, but they're not flat. Uh, so choosing the prior is equivalent, totally equivalent, to choosing the metric in which the PDF is uniform. Because you can always reparameterize your variable and stretch it such that it becomes uniform. You just use the probability the, the probability integral transform, and you can make flat whatever, right? So Jeffrey chooses the metric according to Fisher information. Fisher information, the inverse of the uh, covariance matrix. But okay, uh, you can compute a number that tells you what the, what the information content of some data is. And this results in different priors. So for instance, for the Poisson case of accounting experiment with no background, the flat prior, the the objective prior, the Jeffrey prior, is one over square root of mu. Why? Well, I don't know. It's mathematically <laughs> something that comes up out, out of the calculation. If you have background, the probability density should be mu plus p to the minus 0 0.5. This is also funny because uh, the prior belief on the, the mean of the signal will depend on the background level. Uh, this is what you should plug in if you want your posteriors to be minimally influent. And the Gaussian with unknown mean as a flat prior in mu, really. Flat in this sense. In uh, particle physics, we call flat priors, uh, and statisticians call these flat priors. Uh, what I would like to stress is that uh, in principle, we can do Bayesian analysis, and there are a trickle of results that we publish that are using Bayesian uh, techniques. As I said, we don't need to be Bayesians if you use Bayes theorem sometimes. But uh, the point is that uh, when we do this, we should always do a sensitivity analysis. We want to inform the reader of our papers that if we took this prior, and if we had taken this other prior, the result would have changed this way. So by testing this with many different possible ancestors, then you can actually put out a result uh, using Bayes' the theorem, and uh, you, can, you, can, you can do that, okay? But you need to do it, because if you see that your results change, change too much based on changes of your prior belief, then you are in trouble. Then, then probably you should do a, a frequentist result. When you have more than one dimension, it's actually very difficult to define priors in multiple dimensions. Uh, and also that's because if you change the variables, all the probability density can move from one point to another in a space of multiple dimensions. Uh, it, it's very complicated. Uh, okay, so I don't want to, to, to spend too much time on this, but uh, despite uh, the flourishing of Bayesian techniques uh, in, uh, in finance and everything, 
And this is also due to the fact that we have more computing power, that we have uh, used, uh, started to use MCMC sampling. We use uh, computing techniques that allow us to use these, uh, these priors and do calculations. Despite this, in high energy physics, their use is limited. So going back to classical statistics inference, uh, we do things uh, based on uh, works that were done in the early 20th century by Fisher, by other statisticians. And it is good, it gives you precise answers, uh, but does not provide, as we said, uh, a decision theory. And it will never give you the probability of a constant of nature having a certain value. Okay? Uh, so with Neyman's technique, uh, we can derive confidence intervals around our point estimates. Uh, they don't give you any confidence that an unknown parameter is contained within the interval that we quote. It is either inside or outside. What we can say is that that interval belongs to a set that has those properties of coverage, okay? Instead, Bayesians have a different construction where instead they will speak of credible intervals because they have plugged in some credible prior. And then there's another thing that are likelihood ratios. Likelihood ratio test, uh, we'll discuss it in a second, uh, is also based on a frequentist construction. And uh, they can be used to, to do interval estimation and hypothesis testing. And they don't need a prior. So let's do a likelihood ratio test. Uh, because the likelihood is invariant, un invariant under reparameterization, you can take the likelihood uh, uh, of two hypotheses and uh, you, can, uh, you can take uh, uh, likelihood ratio, actually likelihood values themselves, you can use them to find the most likely values of a parameter. Uh, you don't integrate the likelihood function that is not a PDF, but you can construct a way to extract intervals. So you can select all the values of a parameter such that uh, the difference of the likelihood from the value that it has uh, maximizes it. So this is the maximum of your likelihood. And you can see what parameters of theta uh, remain in a, in a region where you are less than a certain number of sigmas away. So in the example we were making uh, uh, yesterday uh, of reconstructing showers, the position of a shower, you will remember that we were getting likelihood profiles like this, which are parabolas or similar to parabolas because uh, they, the data are not uh, Gaussian, but uh, you are close to the to the, to the Gaussian limit. So anyways, this is uh, in a logarithmic uh, scale. This is your maximum of the likelihood is here. And this is your parameter estimate for x0, uh, x0 hat. And now you say, okay, this is the maximum of the likelihood. And so this is the most likely value of the parameter given the data, but uh, I can take a difference of the likelihood by a certain number and I can derive an interval on the, the parameter. This is a likelihood ratio interval because it's obtained by taking the ratio of two likelihoods or the difference of two log likelihoods. Okay, likelihood ratio because you don't take the logarithm or if you have the logarithm, it's the logarithm likelihood difference. And this works because you know it works because this is a parabola. This is like a, a Gaussian distribution, so this is actually a number of sigmas. And there's this minus two factor because you know the chi squared and the likelihood of this factor of two difference. So uh, this is uh, actually uh, has good properties. It approaches a central confidence interval with a confidence level that corresponds to the number of Gaussian standard deviations that you are putting in the equation. So for instance, if you want uh, a 68.3% confidence level, you choose Z equal one here. And if you want five sigma, you will put the Z square equal 25. It is an approximation because the likelihood is not guaranteed to be parabolic, okay? And sometimes it undercovers. But it's typically a very good approximation in many cases. 
And this depends on a theorem that is called Wilkes theorem, which I will not go in. Maybe I have a slide later. Maybe tomorrow we'll deal with Wilkes theorem, in fact. And uh, these likelihood ratio tests are what is returned uh, uh, to you if you use uh, minuit and uh, if you run the minus routine. It will tell you the interval as a, a likelihood ratio. Uh, we have already seen that uh, the likelihood uh, uh, inference can be troublesome when you are close to a boundary of a parameter. And in fact, this uh, is, uh, uh, remains a problem here. This is an example. We have a likelihood ratio interval for a Poisson process with three events observed. And of course, the maximum likelihood estimate for the Poisson mean when you observe three events is exactly three. This is the likelihood function when you plug in the number three in the Poisson distribution, which is all that there is for one data point. So now if you take the less, the, the variation of the likelihood from this value and you ask that it is equal to one, this is the profile of the likelihood in this case. And this yields, uh, this is just a function of the true value of mu when you get this, this curve. And the delta log likelihood is just, uh, uh, is giving you this interval. And it gives you this interval. And uh, it somehow covers, not perfectly. Uh, if you were a Bayesian, you would have used uh, to multiply this by a flat prior and it would give you this interval. If you use Neyman's construction, it would have given you this interval. So you see, you get different answers. So these are the three methods that we can use, the flat prior in this case, and you can see that they give you different answers. That's because they are asking different questions, okay? And there's another thing that uh, it's good mentioning before we leave for today, this topic, uh, and it's the likelihood principle. So we have seen the likelihood ratio-based methods. We have seen Bayesian methods. Only the probability density for obtaining the data that you did get is used for extracting the interval. Everything is contained in the likelihood function. So likelihood ratio or Bayes theorem, you only look at the data that you observed. You plug in the data, you get the likelihood, and you do the inference. You are not at all looking at probabilities for obtaining other data, which is exactly what, base, what frequentists do. In typical frequentist calculations, like uh, getting a p-value, you are integrating a PDF by looking at data that you didn't get. So this is a very striking difference, if you think about it. And it's a, at the source of uh, the discrepancy in uh, uh, accepting or rejecting the likelihood principle. So abiding or not the likelihood principle. The likelihood principle says that if two experiments yield likelihood functions which are proportional, so that means that they are one on top of the other with the same shape, for instance, then your inferences from two experiments should be identical. Likelihood functions that are proportional means uh, that you should drive the same inference. And this is built uh, by construction in Bayesian inference, uh, but it's violated by the p-values and uh, the name and confidence intervals. You cannot have, in fact, uh, uh, both the best of both worlds of fulfilling the likelihood principle and having guaranteed coverage, as name and construction gives you. Uh, in practice, uh, the likelihood principle is probably a little bit too restrictive, but it is useful to keep it as a lamppost because if your result badly violates this likelihood principle, you are better looking to it a little bit in more care and, uh, and probably do some uh, sensitivity analysis, try Bayesian techniques, try other things. So let's make an example. You expect uh, uh, that you have background sample from a mean B. So you have again a counting experiment. So we know what we're talking about. And we know B very precisely, okay? So Poisson mean B. And you have a signal potentially in the data that uh, is sampled from a mean mu. 
So the total number of events will be sampled from a Poisson of mean mu plus b, right? Poisson processes that are themselves. So the probability that you draw for n is uh, mu plus b to the n, if uh, the Poisson distribution, OK? Now, when you perform the experiment, uh, let's say that you observe zero events. So what you write for the likelihood is the likelihood of the parameter mu that describes the signal is mu plus b at the zero, blah, blah. And this is equal to x of minus mu times x of minus b. Because you observed zero events, and uh, you should note here that uh, you, if you change the background from, now let's imagine that you have zero background or you have background larger than zero. And you look at the likelihood, how does the likelihood changes, uh, change if you change the background from zero to a number larger than zero? It only changes by a constant factor, that is this factor here. You change by a certain number, the, you, you change this constant here, you change the likelihood by this constant x to the minus b. And since uh, when you do a Bayes theorem calculation, uh, you, you will renormalize this, you will have this factor at the normal denominator, it doesn't depend on the parameter of interest mu. Uh, when you observe zero events, so when you are in this particular case, likelihood based inference about the signal mean mu, which you will use uh, to draw from the likelihood, is independent on the background that you expect. It gets renormalized that way. So you have a counting experiment. Uh, you observe zero events. The inference that you set about uh, the signal mean doesn't depend on how bad your background rejection factor was in your experiment. So you see that this makes a, a difference with the frequentist inference because when you construct confidence intervals in this case, if you observe zero events, this is less likely to happen if you have background larger than zero than if, these, that if you have zero events. And therefore, you will have a narrower confidence interval around the mean mu than if, if, you, uh, uh, than, than if you have a larger background. So in one case, the inference doesn't depend on background. In the other, it does depend on the background. So in fact, this is kind of disturbing because uh, imagine you have two experiments that uh, look for the appearance of tau neutrinos. And one of them has a lot of background because it is uh, at ground level. And the other is uh, under two kilometers of rock and there's zero background. And both experiments observe no tau neutrinos. And uh, the lousy experiment gets to put better confidence intervals around the mean of the appearance rate because it has larger backgrounds and it has observed zero events. So this is unfair, right? The, the lousy experiment gets to put narrower intervals. That is what the frequentist construction does. Instead, the likelihood principle that is uh, fulfilled by this uh, by this setup, if the likelihood intervals will give you the same intervals. So let's compare these methods and then we finish. Uh, Bayes and credible intervals need a prior. So they allow to put in your personal beliefs about uh, the quantity you're measuring, but yeah, it can be a good or a bad thing. Uh, the true value is a random variable, so they speak of the probability of, uh, of parameters of nature. They obey, obey the likelihood principle, can be a basis of decision theory, and they don't guarantee coverage. The frequentist confidence intervals guarantee coverage, do not need a prior. Actually, they don't want a prior. The random variables in this construction are the extrema of the intervals, mu1, mu2 in the inference that you get. They don't obey the likelihood principle. And they use the probability of data not obtained for doing inference on the parameter of interest. Finally, the likelihood ratio intervals don't need a prior either. Uh, and they obey the likelihood principle, but they don't always cover. So 
now you have a, 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 a like a panorama of, of these three methods and tomorrow we will see them at work and then we'll move on to other things like hypothesis testing and uh, and uh, goodness of fit and uh, other things. Do you have any questions for me today? Yeah, so uh, when a statistician talks about the flat, prior being flat, they refer to the work of Jeffries. And, uh, and uh, in fact, I, I, may, I may have missed it. Yes, probably it was, I, I missed it. So they refer to the work of Jeffries that uh, did all this work uh, with uh, Fisher information. And, uh, but where is it? Uh, here. Yeah, so flatness here doesn't mean anything about uh, the distribution of the parameter of interest uh, that you assume. It means that uh, 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 the flatness is in the information. So basically, uh, it says this, if you choose this particular PDF for the parameter of interest, uh, you are injecting uh, uh, the least amount of information. So basically, the derivative with respect to the information, if you want, is uh, the least. Uh, okay, so in that sense, it is flat. Uh, what physicists would talk about uh, a flat prior, they do mean it. They do mean that they are implying a uniform distribution for the parameter that they are talking about. Remember, though, that when you make a transformation of a variable, a flat prior becomes something that is not flat in physicist jargon. Well, uh, if you want, if you want, uh, uh, take Bayes' theorem if you want. That here you have a, a distribution function that is normalized. Here, and it's a posterior. It's, and in order to get a distribution, a function that is, uh, has properties of, of, of being a normalized distribution of the parameter of interest, you, you do some mathematical calculation that take another probability density function that is also a function that has a normalization and you multiply it by something else, okay? So you can only have one density function of each side of the equation. So I, I don't know if I understood your question correctly, but the likelihood function is a function of the parameter, but it, uh, let's say, it's not normalized, it cannot be normalized. It, it, it is a number that describes, uh, uh, that describes uh, not the probability, but it tells you what is the, uh, yeah, it is a function of the data that tells you what are the most likely values of the parameter, but it is not a density. I don't know how to explain it though, and I'm sorry if I cannot make a good job for you. It's, it just comes from this mathematical definition. Yes. 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 That is right, yes. That's absolutely right. And yes, you have taken the data, you get a number, and that number depends on the parameter. But it's a function, it's not a density, yes. Yeah. You multiply this number by by a density, and you get another density. Yeah. Only thing that you can see the like this, otherwise you can't number. Yes, that's right. That's right. Important to note. Yes. Yes. 
Neyman construction. Uh, so uh, uh, what I understood is you need to build the, let's say the confidence interval set before doing the experiment. Right? Yes. But in when we do the world averaging or let's say averaging of many experiments, we already have the data, we already have the result and then we do, do this thing. So are we doing it diligently or there is? So What's you can there? have the data already, but you don't uh, uh, use it to construct uh, the, uh, the, the belt, the confidence belt. So we have some information and that might like bias our mindset or something like that. When you have information, you can always bias yourself. That is exactly true. In fact, when you are doing combination of measurements, you have the measurements on your table and so that can actually become a problem. In fact, uh, we have moved in particle physics uh, to blind analysis uh, in the late 90s, but before then, people were looking at the data all, all the time. And in fact, they were often biasing their results. People were reading too much into fluctuations, bumps, or stuff like that, because they're, they were not doing things correctly. And uh, this changed uh, uh, like 30 years ago or so. But, uh, but yes, if you're doing a combination of measurements, you still have this problem. You're looking at some results. Uh, the way this can bias you is that you, ca you could assign, uh, uh, you could assign uh, correlation terms in one way or another. You could decide to uh, remove one result from the averaging. This is actually what uh, is sometimes done. Or you could blow up the uncertainties of some of the results before doing the average. That is what the PDG does. They have a scaling fact, a scale factor of the uncertainties for some measurements. Sometimes they want to average many results and they are in a situation where the results are not giving you a very good chi squared. And then uh, they blow up the uncertainties by a, all of the uncertainties by a certain scale factor to get a chi squared of one. This is a method that is described in the particle data group uh, uh, review of particle properties. Uh, so this is, these are all things that you do a posteriori. And uh, there's another annoying thing that actually we do in CMS and Atlas that when we are combining measurements that have correlations between them, we assign correlations to be either zero or one. This has been done from the recent top cross sec top uh, mass measurement, I think, also. And the, the annoying bit is that uh, when we put a correlation coefficient equal to one, we think that we are being conservative because this will uh, enlarge our confidence intervals, but in fact, it is not. It is not necessarily true that by assuming the highest possible correlation coefficient, you are getting the largest uh, uncertainty bars at the end of the day. It depends on the peculiarity of the problem. But okay, I'm, I'm expanding too much. But uh, yes, this, that was a very good question. Yes. How does the likelihood function depend on the choice of? No. The likelihood function is factored away. So this is the likelihood function, the probability that you get some data given a, a certain parameter. And this is the prior. The prior is, uh, is specified beforehand. And you multiply the two and you get a posterior. The posterior depends on the likelihood. So the posterior is this one and it will be larger if the, if the likelihood is larger for that particular data set. Now, larger is a PDF, so it's, it has a distribution. The distribution, so to make it a, a visual, a visual uh, cartoon, if you want, you have a parameter you're estimating and you have a prior distribution on the parameter. And then you have a likelihood function that tells you that actually you are measuring uh, more, likelihood, more likely values for the parameter being here. These two things don't talk to each other, but you multiply them, and you might actually multiply this by this very small tail, and the posterior becomes something that uh, will still resemble the, the, the prior here, but it will enhance this region. So it, it's a mathematical multiplication of the two. Okay, thank you for your questions. <laughs>